people joining uh, later. Um, so welcome to this this uh, session on. It's all about the patient today, and um, uh, we hear a lot about patient centricity and patient engagement. So we thought um, precisely today, as you know, is the the clinical trials day. Uh, we thought that it it is a good uh, opportunity to host this event driven by the patients. And um, it is uh, nice to see that there's so many uh, patients that have uh, taken the opportunity to, to, to participate, and we're very grateful for that. So um, I'm sure we have also people from the industry or from investigational sites, uh, people that do clinical trials and, and, and organize this professionally, which is also great, um, so that we can also engage with all the stakeholders involved, because I think that's our objective also. So welcome again to this session. We are going to be doing this obviously online. Uh, you can put indeed your cameras on that you see the face. It's always nice to see the people. Um, we will also um, we will put everyone on mute because there's a lot of people. Otherwise, there's, there might be a lot of background. If you have questions, you can use the same functionality as the countries that you added now, the chat function to add add your questions uh, during the session, and we 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 will review the questions uh, on an ongoing basis. And if it's a burning question, uh, we'll deal with it. Otherwise, we'll deal with the questions at the end of the session. All right. Having said that, um, I'll kick it off and I'll, I'll first kick it off by saying that the session is being recorded and it will be made available for a broader audience. In that sense, we're recording it and we'll put it on our website, the ECCRT website, uh, for people that have not been able to make it today or if you want to listen to it again, uh, you will be able to find it on the ECCRT website. Now, before I start, talking about uh, ECCRT. Let me introduce myself first. So I will be your, your host uh, for today. Uh, my name is Benedikt van Nieuwenhoven and I'm the, the founder and the, the managing director of the ECCRT. And um, in that capacity, it's really my pleasure um, to, to be here and to also like guide us through this dialogue and this discussion that we hope to have. We hope to really make this a very interactive experience driven by the patients. And we really want the patients to have the last word and, 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 and most of the words here in, in this session. Um, so that's about me, about ECCRT, the European Centre for Clinical Research Training, as, as the, the company names uh, already like uh, tells you. We are an, a training organisation and um, we are training people that do clinical research, that, that clinical research professionals, which uh, our mission being facilitating clinical research professionals. And so in order for them to, to work in the most optimal way, and clinical research is changing quite a lot, as you know, and nowadays uh, with all digitalization and the experiences that people uh, gain, so it is changing. So that means that education is very important in that. Uh, and we do this for the benefit of the patient. And that's why I think we also took this opportunity of the Clinical Trials Day to give the word to, um, to the patient. As you can see, so we do, do a lot of trainings and I'm not going to go into details. If you are interested in, in more information, you can always reach out to us. You can go to our website, to our social media channels uh, to find out uh, what we do. And uh, if you think we can help you in uh, achieving that same mission, uh, feel free uh, to reach out to us and we will have, be happy to have a discussion. Now for today's agenda, uh, which you see on the screen now, uh, we have uh, three parts. Um, so we, uh, I will first cover uh, the introductory parts, where uh, I will also like talk a little bit about what clinical research is precisely and how it's evolving, because uh, there are people here that are no so I'm also even well more, I would say. So this is also for us our goal uh, to uh, using the clinical trials day to create awareness about uh, clinical uh, research, and uh, we'll give some introductions to that uh, how it has evolved also over the time. But then the bulk of the time we are going to really have the patients talking. We have a number of patients, and I'll introduce them uh, later to you, uh, that have all, each of them have a story to tell and. We will end the session with a panel discussion amongst those uh, patients uh, on how uh, they have been uh, living that experience and on how they also see the future 
uh, of clinical research. And again, for those that joined late, put yourself on mute, please. And if you have questions, do uh, put them in the chat. We'll monitor this uh, chat on an ongoing basis. All right, so moving forward, actually, I'm going to start with a question to the audience. And that question is appearing on the slide. And I will also now launch uh, a poll. And so in, in the chat, you will see um, that this, this, there's going to be the questions going to appear there as well. Or it's going to be either in, in, the, in the chat or in a, a pop-up window that is appearing. So if all of you could uh, answer the question uh, uh, to which organization you belong, or if you are just a citizen without any scientific knowledge, that's the first option. Or if you are a more scientific person, but not involved in clinical research, you work in a pharma company or a CRO or consultancy, or in an investigational site or anyone else. I, I know that there's also uh, uh, governmental uh, people here or regulators, uh, so they can use the other uh, as an answer. Just quickly. Um, I can also see in the chat actually the responses. Uh, um, so there you can also see who is in the audience. Uh, and uh, so far, the majority is actually in others, uh, which is interesting. Um, so there are also still quite some um, uh, industry representation and uh, so 14% in the pharma and 18% in CRO or consultancy and 16% uh, investigational sites. Um, there's so far like 7% citizens without scientific knowledge and 7% the knowledge but not involved in clinical research. But as you can see, it's quite a uh, varied group, which is nice because um, uh, yeah, we can have the patients alone, but the patients alone are not going to like, uh, achieve a lot. So it's a question of uh, working all together to uh, for the benefit of those patients. And I see that also some some people have answered in the um, the chat, which is also fine. Uh, you can do that as well. All right, so moving to add another question. I have two more questions for you uh, uh, to come. Um, so the question is, did you ever participate in a clinical trial? Uh, um, so I'm going to launch the poll. Uh, oops, here we go. So yes, I have participated in the past or I'm currently in an ongoing clinical trial or I am planning to enroll in a trial or no, I didn't need to enroll uh, and that would be very good news for you. Uh, or uh, otherwise, um, the last option is uh, no. Yeah, trials is not for me. Okay. So we're going to quickly look at the chat to see what the answer is. Yeah. So the, the vast majority has didn't have the need yet to to be enrolled in a clinical trial, which is great. Um, so, but there are, um, yeah, in total, like 15%, if I can calculate quickly, 16%, it's rising uh, of the audience that have participated in a clinical trial, which is uh, great to see because I love also to, to hear the feedback from those people. Right. If you don't find the poll, feel free to answer it in the chat, and that's also possible. Okay. Uh, the, for the ones that have not been uh, participating in a clinical trial, the next that's the next question is intended for you. Uh, so the question is: Would you consider doing that in the future? So if you get a disease or if you have a condition where um, a clinical trial might be uh, an, an, an option for you. Would you participate or not? And wait, let me just launch that poll. So, um, I see that someone else has taken control of the presentation, which uh, kind of asks you not to do. OK, um, so the, the current poll 
that is life is about if you would participate in the future. And wow, this is great. This is really great to, to see 100% of the people say yes. So um, that's that's great to see. So nobody is afraid to participate in the economic file. That's already like a first uh, nice observation of this event, I would say. Uh, actually, I didn't expect this. Um, so this is uh, nice, nice to see. Okay, so we're good for now with the polls. We have a couple of uh, smaller questions at the end, uh, but for now, uh, let let me zoom into um, in the actual content. And um, well, as you know, and I mentioned it already a couple of times. Um, so the uh, purpose of, of the, the reason why we do this today is, is because of its clinical trial day and, and clinical trial day is every year on the 20th of May. Uh, it's been already for several years. And the reason for it is that uh, that on the 20th of May back in 17, I think it's 47 or something, uh, James Lind uh, like started the, the, the very first clinical trial ever. And, and that day is now actually used to also recognize uh, recognize everyone who is involved in clinical research, including the patients, the participants in clinical trials, as well as the caregivers and, and, and the doctors and, and the hospitals, but also the industry and, 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 and the people really uh, making uh, great efforts to uh, bring new therapies to the market and not to forget also the regulators uh, who are also working um, very hard to make sure that the therapies that come to the market uh, are effective, but also safe for patients. Uh, so that's um, uh, very important that, that we also recognize that. The 20th of May, we always do an event as ECCRT uh, with the main purpose of like creating awareness of clinical trials to uh, of clinical research to the broader public. Um, and well, as I mentioned, I'm going to say very, very brief words for those people that have not so uh, a good understanding of clinical research. But as I saw that most of the people uh, would participate in the trial, I, I would hope that uh, most of you will know. Um, but on the slide, you see the whole drug development. Eh? So the whole drug development of, an, of a new medicine uh, or a new therapy um, is taking quite long. Eh? It's, it's taking several years. Eh? And a, a big part, actually the biggest part of that development is, uh, is reserved for uh, or is taken by the clinical trials. Eh? Clinical trials is clinical studies to test the safety and efficacy of the product on human beings. And everything that comes before is either in the lab or with animals or in, yeah, in, within the company that develops the drug or the organization. But then well, as soon as human beings are involved, uh, then uh, we call them clinical trials. There's also the, of course, the approval period uh, where when all the trials are positive and the, the drug is approvable, a submission is done for the authorities to get the drug approved. And, and then even then it's not finished because then there's also like a phase four, so these post marketing studies. Now, the studies are divided in, in different phases and I'm not going to dwell on too many things here, uh, but there's typically four phases and I'm not going to make it more complicated than, than, uh, than it is. Um, so where the first phase is, is really on most of the time on healthy volunteers to see how the new product behaves in the human body and mainly to do uh, to, to test the safety of the product. And that safety is, con the testing for the safety is continued in the phase two, but then on patients suffering from the disease that the new treatment hopes to cure. So you still focus there on the safety, small groups with quite strict criteria. And so to limit comorbidities, for instance, to avoid that the, this, this in, uh, influencing factors from other diseases or other medication that is taken to quite selected groups of patients. Whereas then in the next phase, if all if all the previous ones have been uh, giving good results, uh, then you move to phase three, where the audience or the, the audience, I shouldn't say the participants are a, a, a larger group eh, that also eventually suffer from uh, other diseases um, and, and that uh, uh, where the criteria are not so strict and where also the group is larger uh, to mimic as much as possible um, the, the, the real world population that later on is going to take the, the new drug. And then broadly it is registered and then there's phase four 
and that phase four is also important to uh, like allow in, in indeed a real world setting and the drug is on the market um, to in real world setting allow a larger exposure even more and longer exposure where you can also like fine tune the indication and, and change eventually the indication uh, or, or at least find out that there are different possible Possible reactions uh, based on the indicate uh, based on the type of patient. So that's also an important uh, phase, and um, not to be underestimated. I'm, I'm going to let it uh, with this here for for the type of, of studies. Uh, I can talk for ages about this if you want, but that would be then for another occasion, as I, I guess. Um, now. How clinical research has evolved, and I mentioned that already several times. Some of you, uh, well, uh, may know this then, that, that are already long uh, in 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 uh, involved in clinical research. Uh, twenty years ago, precisely, actually twenty years ago, uh, back in in two thousand and two, uh, there was an article in in the Times magazine, uh, and that was the front cover that you see on the screen now, where actually patients were. Participating in clinical trials were presented as human uh, guinea pigs. So at that time, that's not a very positive image to give, you know. Uh, that that and, and that at that time the perception was very much like that that pe people participating in a clinical trial were really test subjects, and they were also called subjects uh, very often. And that also luckily has changed over time. And those changes have gradually evolved. And and. Actually, this year there was a new cover of, of Time magazine, uh, which you see on the screen. And you see the cage is still there, but as you see, the, the patient got out of the cage. Not only the cage is open, but also the patient got out and is on top of the cage. And as you see in the picture, the, the lady who is the patient shows confidence. She's confident and actually she has a say, she has a word. And I'm very happy that we have patients today here in our event. but. On a broader scale, patients are very, very much uh, engaged and um, have a say and are actually really considered as a partner amongst all the other stakeholders. And you see them also in the picture. So you see really that she's almost driving. And, and that's really a very nice picture, I think, uh, to, to show that evolution in those 20 years. And well, there is many initiatives, uh, both from private, uh, from industry, as academic, as governmental initiatives to uh, to actually drive that patient involvement. Uh, patient centricity is has been a buzzword for for many times and longer times. Um, and and there is uh, organizations such as Eupathy, and, and we will talk about Eupathy uh, later on. And we have actually uh, the, the 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 honor of having two uh, Eupathy fellows here uh, 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 representing. Um, their, their knowledge and understanding. But you have also organizations as, such as uh, uh, Patient Focused Medicine Development, PFMD, uh, or the European Patient Forum, and, and many more. Uh, but there are a lot of initiatives that all have the, 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 the objective and the vision and the mission to like bring the patient in front and, 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 and have their say and their input uh, taken into account. Because what the industry of course, always has to uh, has tried doing is develop the best possible drugs, obviously. Um, but the best the question then is, what is the best possible drug? Is it uh, something that is the most efficient? And what is efficiency? Is it in terms of like curing disease or improving your quality of life? Perception of an invest a doctor may be different than a patient, for instance. All that has evolved in, in many years, and, and I hope we'll have an, an interesting dialogue in the, in the panel discussion around that. So that has changed quite a lot. And I think uh, it's a good evolution that patients do have their say in, in many aspects of drug development. And, and in, in the slide that you see it, uh, uh, now on the screen, it's, it's, an, it's a UPATI slide actually, where it's indicated where patient is involved or can be involved in, in the whole um, uh, drug development cycle, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into details, but as you can see, it's it's really across the whole board, uh, and even not only in clinical trials. It's even also outside of clinical trials that's already in the very early stages, in the in the discovery and preclinical stages, that input from a patient uh, is very much um, very much uh, welcome and very much appreciated, and like in terms of like 
what is the priority? Which molecule should go first? Uh, or is it even if even the formulation can have a big impact uh, for a patient ultimately? But then, well, obviously, and that's quite straightforward in clinical research, the impact of a patient and the possibility for patient engagement is even higher. Uh, and that goes from developing a protocol uh, to focus on the right points, uh, the right endpoints, the right uh, outcomes uh, for uh, the patients rather than um, anything else. And that includes also like input during the, the course of a study, uh, um, when the study is, in, in, is conducted, and that starts with the ethics review. Uh, there's, nowadays there's patients or patient representatives in the ethics committees, for instance, which is, is also very important. And that goes up, up to the regulatory affairs, uh, where indeed the drug is then, uh, or the, um, the, the dossier, the file is submitted for approval. In that review process, also we see that more and more patients get involved uh, and are engaged. And actually that's, that's, that is uh, represented quite nicely in this graph here. This graph represents the number of, of patient uh, interactions with EMA activities. And, 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 and that's like, showing very clearly the, the increasing trends and, and the uh, increasing involvement of patients and consumers uh, in also what the European Medicines Agency, the EMA, is doing. So the regulator also is having a clear uh, uh, ear for uh, what the patient uh, would like to see. And, and I hope, of course, that this increasing trend is further, to go, uh, is further going to increase. And with that, I think I've already, I have the feeling that I've talked already way too much, actually, because I was only planned to, to, to talk for 10 minutes. We are going to move into the patients. We're going to let the patients uh, talk. And um, we have three patients live uh, available here for us. We have also two videos of, of patients that I, I found were quite also uh, nice to share with all of you. Uh, and we will start with those videos uh, first. And uh, and here I have to say it's courtesy to pharma.be, the, the, the Belgian Association of the Pharmaceutical Industry, who has been kind enough uh, to share these videos with the approval of the patients, which you will see in the videos. So let me start the video and um, I'll... Uh, Okay, but this was the first video. I, I've seen indeed that uh, there's a comment that it's very small. It is small, but you can uh, zoom out yourself. I can't do this for you. You have to zoom out uh, yourself so that you can make it full screen. Um, yes, because the, indeed 
the, the testimonial was in Dutch, uh, but there are subtitles uh, for you. All right, um, so I think this was a um, very good um, uh, representation of like a, a patient uh, having HIV. And we'll, we'll first show the two movies and then uh, we'll go into the discussion. So the next uh, movie is coming up uh, right now. So you can enlarge it by clicking on this little icon in the lower right corner. Okay, um, well, I think with those two testimon video testimonials, uh, well, it was a clear uh, statement that indeed it, it improved their lives quite significantly in over time with the two uh, diseases that they were suffering from. And this is uh, the good news that indeed uh, the, the therapeutic options have in, uh, improved for many diseases over the years. And um, with but that's not the case for all diseases, unfortunately. And uh, and we'll, you will also hear this in, in the next testimonials. And Sorry for that. Uh, you will also hear this in the next testimonials. And the next testimonials are life. Uh, because the, uh, life always is much better. And uh, I'm very happy that we have uh, three uh, representatives here. I, I shouldn't say um, patients because not all of them are patients themselves. And I'm going to ask uh, Joanna to, to, to speak first uh, and to, to tell her story. And uh, it's quite striking. So, Johanna, you have the floor. OK, thank you. <clears throat> Friday, the 13th of December 2013 was an ordinary day. I was just bored as the same things happened over and over in my life and quite tired because this is how you feel when you have to raise two children, cope with your jobs, endless tasks and, dead and deadlines and do all the household chores. Little did I know back then though that, that this would be the last ordinary day of my life. This is the day we received my daughter Melina's diagnosis. Melina was at the time a joyful and very active four years old. Her smile would brighten up everything around her and would warm everyone's hearts. The diagnosis came as a shock, San Filippo syndrome, also known as mucopolysaccharidosis type 3 or MPS3. San Filippo syndrome is a rare terminal neurodegenerative disease. It is progressive and therefore causes children to lose all of the skills they have already gained. 
It also causes seizures and motor disorders, debilitating pain and suffering, and eventually, and eventually death, often before the second decade of life. Because of its neurodegenerative nature and multisystem impact, San Filippo syndrome is often called childhood Alzheimer's. This was the day we lost the child we thought we had. We were overwhelmed, confused and shattered. We just refused to accept the fact that our daughter, who had just learned how to ride a bike and loved to run and swim, had in fact this horrible disease and would soon be, be unable to walk and talk. And as if this wasn't enough, due to the disease's hereditary nature, we had to test our second daughter, Constantina too. Our, night, our nightmare would, be, would have a sequel. One month later, Costadina would receive the same as exactly diagnosis. She was just six months old. Our entire world was crushed. There was nothing that could give us any sense of meaning anymore, and we felt lost, desolate, lonely, and completely heartbroken. There are actually no words to describe that feeling. The only thing I wanted was to crawl into my bed, hide myself under my duvet, and never come out again. Life, life as we knew it would never be the same again. A few days later, my mother instinct came, came out into place and urged me to take action. I couldn't just sit there and grip my daughters while they were still alive. I realized that I had to do something to help them. All Google search for San Filippo treatments came back negative, which didn't make any sense at all. I mean, I thought, come on, we live on the 20th century. People have achieved the unimaginable, unimaginable. Huge advances in all scientific areas and no treatment for San Filippo. How is, how is this even possible? But then I came across some clinical trials that were taking place in different parts of the world. Without any hesitation or second thoughts, I decided to go ahead and take part. Anyway, a, a clinical trial seemed like our only hope whatsoever and our last chance to save our girls. Unfortunately, Melina didn't fulfill the criteria to take place in the study. She would Uh, Johanna, something is wrong with your sound. I think you, you're on mute. Uh, maybe Andre, you have put her, uh, uh, Johanna, on mute. Sorry, you didn't hear yeah. anything up to yeah. now. Uh, just continue, it's fine. Yeah. No, we, hear, we heard everything. Do you want me to start from, to start no, again? Fine. Just, just oh, okay. Go. Just a minute. We heard you until the, the clinical trial, uh, she couldn't get in. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, when she was 18 months old, she received, my second daughter, Costadina, she received intrathecally the enzyme that her body looks, lacks for the first time. We were at the time 10 months after diagnosis, and it was such a relief that we were at last able to do something that had the potential to save her. The procedure went on for the following two years. Cosadina's progress was good and stable as our hopes were raised. Just to mention here at this point that, that before taking part at the clinical trial, we had to sign lots of paperwork with a pharmaceutical company. Those expl explained all possible risks and potential, potential benefits. The benefits, though, significantly overweighted the risks as without taking the drug, death would be the only outcome for my darling child. Before administering... No. By mentioning this, I want to highlight the interplay between research and humans. It's like a circle. We serve as experimental subjects, but then we benefit from scientific findings and medicines who aim to treat common or more rare diseases. Needless to mention that during these two years, I was happy for my Costadina, who was given the chance to live longer on one hand, but desperate on the other hand for my Melina, who wasn't given this chance and instead just waiting for her, for her disease to progress and eventually take her life. But again, Cusadina, through her clinical trial, gave me power and made me stronger for my Melina. I was secretly hoping that the drug Cusadina was taking would prove to be effective and it would save Melina's life as well. It would, it would be such a lovely story after all. The young girl who saved her older sister's life. 
And since then, there is re this remains my main aspiration, that one day San Filippo will belong to the past, that my children and many other children ar around the globe will be able to say, I used to have San Filippo. But if we want this to happen, we have to overcome, overcome our fears, think logically and help science to make progress. It's our responsibility for our children, for our relatives, for our friends and for all people out there who may one day receive a similar diagnosis. And I say this now, now that my mother had just finished her chemotherapies and is still alive and free from cancer. Thanks to some people who may 50 or 100 years ago overcame their fears and trusted in science in order to explore procedures and medicine that could treat or cure breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Joanna, for sharing this. this. This is very striking and emotional and um, I, the, the, it makes us realize how important the work we are all doing. And also, everyone uh, on, 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 in this 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 call here uh, is contributing somehow, uh, and we all really have to like continue to fight hard. And 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 especially in the rare disease area, this there's still a lot of work to do. So thank you for for sharing. Thank you, that. Um, thank you Tom. Thank you. So let us move to the the, the second uh, testimonial. We have Sabine, uh, who is, as I mentioned before, also a Upati fellow uh, and. Uh, Sabine, why don't you share your story? <laughs> Hello from Vienna, Austria. Uh, I'm a metastatic, I'm a de novo metastatic breast cancer patient, which started shortly after my 50th birthday in February 2014. Um, I was diagnosed and I was asked if I would like to go into a clinical trial, which was not a typical one, and it was as an, a state near clinical trial um, where you get operated first and then the systemic therapy starts and radiation, etc. That clinical trial, I found out later, was uh, shut off about not even a year after I started, but I had, of course, um, signed in for five years, which was 2014 until 2019. And I had lobular breast cancer, which is 5 to 10 percent, and nowadays we find out that's still different from ductal um, breast cancer. And luckily, my first systemic treatment uh, gave me a stable disease for five and a half years. And in the meantime, at, at, well, I couldn't, I was a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist for children adults and grown-ups and worked in ambulatories and in in family centers but when I got the disease I didn't have the strength anymore to to continue working so I got retired and in 2016 I started with Europa Donor Austria which was a breast cancer organization and then I was vice one of the two vice presidents and I had to to be the contact person for your party and I was there when your party Austria was founded the national platform and then I learned about <clears throat> the patient expert course and from 2017 to 18 I had the luck to be in the third court of the patient expert course and uh, in the meantime uh, Europa Donor Austria doesn't exist anymore in Austria so it's just in 40, 46 other other countries pan-european countries but I'm with Hopeful, which is a very small breast cancer and migration group. I'm in a Facebook group with about 450 metastatic breast cancer patients, male and female, but about 80 per year die, uh, which is about 20%, no, 10%. Um, I, <clears throat> I work uh, with uh, lately, the, the last two, three years, I worked with the Alliance of Oncological Patient Organizations and all can. It's all voluntarily and I'm getting 60 this year and I noticed that it's, it's tiring. It's more tiring than it was in the start and I think I will retire in the near future, mostly. We'll see. Maybe I don't, can, I cannot, but I will, I will try. Yes, that's my 
Yeah, and I learned that it's very difficult because I never got uh, the results of my clinical trial because of the data uh, protection. Um, I, I, I found everything on PubMed later and I contacted uh, ABC, ABCG. Anyway, ABC. CS, CSG <laughs> group <laughs> and uh, they said no data protection and the doctors should but the doctors don't have the time to do all that so it needs special places where where you get informed and it cannot be all on your oncologist they have so much to do if you have the luck that they're in the research too that's fine but it cannot be all on them it's yeah mm -hmm. it's in short my story now I'm in second treatment because I really got older and I had to change once, but I'm stable again. And I have bone metastasis from my breastbone to the femur to the to the legs, upper legs. Well, you are admirable, uh, Sabine. So that you still have that courage to to carry on and and to volunteer even uh, to to uh, to advocate as a patient and um, that's really very much appreciated and indeed it, it is striking that you you had to learn from a publication that results were out uh, but let's let's pick that up for our panel discussion later thank you very much uh, Sabine and now the last um, patient of today is is Jennifer uh, Jenny um, feel free to go Hi everybody, my name is Jenny Camaraji. I'm half English, half Greek. I'm also a UPARTY fellow and based in the UK. I guess you could define me as a quite complex patient. I've been a service using clinical genetics, rheumatology, orthopedics, pain management, cardiology and neurology in five different hospitals. And also I had to jump on a plane twice to go to two different European countries to take part in um, different research projects and I strongly and firmly believe that it's the only way forward to try and reach medical breakthroughs by participating and promoting a better understanding of your condition. And one of my conditions is perhaps gaining okay. awareness at the moment. Um, it's called POTS, which stands for Posture Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome, which is a form of dysautonomia, so that's a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system which is our main sort of uh, switch control that regulates all automatic processes in the body. So I'm quite lucky and quite mildly affected, but I know a lot of patients that are not. And sadly, a lot of people struggle with it because there's no approved drug or licensing in the whole of Europe. And it's also quite complicated. You often have to have other things assessed in um, terms of figuring out what is causing your condition which always uh, creates a lot of uh, challenges and fragmentation in actual care. But recently, I guess we have seen patients with long COVID present with post-COVID POTS, which is a new phenotype. And I'm quite hopeful now that in the future, there will be far more attention paid to it in terms of actually understanding the pathology so that potentially patients across the board can actually access um, therapeutics that can make a difference. Absolutely, yeah. Because indeed, uh, that, yeah, that that is a quite complex situation you are in. Indeed, that's that was your challenge. Yeah? Uh, well, thank you for sharing that with us, and I'm sure we'll also talk about that in, in the in the last part. But actually, uh, which I'd like to uh, start right now. Um, so thank you uh, all three for bringing your uh, your stories. They are very touching, I have to say, and. All our sympathy goes to you in the first place, and 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 your braveness of 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 speaking up here in in in, in this this event, um, and not only in this event, but also in like sharing your experience in general, and 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 doing the work that you do, and 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 trying also to like create that awareness and and and, and engage with other patients in the future for in the end the, the same goal that we all have: I create better therapies and making them available quicker for future patients. All right, um, well, we come to the last part of, of, of the, the, the event today, and uh, this is, as, as we as said, a panel discussion, and um, I'm happy to, to, to moderate that, uh, and we'll have our three uh, nice patients here that uh, we're going to like discuss a number of topics. And, and I would like to like uh, divide it in, in, in three themes, if you want. 
uh, first of all, like actually the experience and why you would participate in a trial. Um, then maybe another chapter on like, yeah, where did you find your trials and, and can something be improved there? Because like access to trials, I'm sure that not, not, not everyone is aware. Um, and then the last part on, on the future of clinical trials. How do you see it evolving? Where you see your needs that given your experience, where could things be improved? Um, but let's start with the first uh, theme. So uh, your experience and, and and maybe first question actually to the three of you. So um, and well, some of you have, and like Joanna has already like uh, alluded to it. Um, so what made you decide to go into a clinical trial? Maybe Sabine, you want to, to go first. I, I was informed by my oncologist and uh, he wanted me to think about it, but I was under pressure. He said, we have no pressure. I said, you don't have, I have. <laughs> then he apologized. I said, put me through the computer, but if I am in the wrong group, I will leave the trial immediately. <laughs> so we, uh, but I wouldn't have known about the trial if I wasn't informed. And there is still no platform where you really can find out with the help of uh, experts which clinical trial could be good for you and which center offers it. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it helped me because, of course, as a, as a psychologist, I knew what random randomization is. And I looked up and said, that's horrible if I'm in the wrong group. And my oncologist said, there is no pressure. And if you leave the trial, I will treat you exactly the same way. <laughs> so I could really... I could really start and then I stayed, but the clinical trial didn't stay because there were not enough persons. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, you were not even informed that it shut down. I saw it because I didn't get the, the questionnaires anymore when I came to the clinic. So I, 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 I thought, okay, something changed, but what? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which was, I guess, quite like, well, frustrating is maybe a big word, but like a disappointment to, to hear, I guess, from for you. For me, the disappointment was that the newspapers wrote about the results when the clinical trial was still ongoing, actually. <clears throat> but it had been shut down and nobody was informed. I was in the third year and I thought, hell, I signed for five years. How can it be finished? And uh, well, later on in, in PubMed, and now I got even more PubMed links because I I wrote to them this year again and said, what about final results? I mean, I'm out of the clinical trial in the third year now and uh, nothing <laughs> at all. And they apologized and uh, yeah, tried to give it back to the oncologist. But uh, yeah, that's not the real solution for the future. All right. Thank you, uh, Sabine. Joanna, is there anything you want to add to what, what you already introduced during the introduction? Uh, I think to me it was quite obvious uh, why you uh, yes, I think I, I already uh, replied to this question. Mm -hmm. or, or Jenny, you want to say anything? I think for me, I became increasingly frustrated seeing clinical trials in the United States, um, never in Europe. And this is what actually led me to try and learn more about health research. And that's how I came to sort of become sponsored um, to do the UPATI training course, and now I'm a patient representative with the European Academy of Neurology Working Group on Autonomic Nervous System Disorders, and I'm actually sort of co-authoring um, papers in the Lancet Neurology around some aspects of my condition. So I think um, it's imperative to try and I think promote better awareness of where to find information on clinical trials, but also reporting of when things, as Sabina said, change or don't go well. So I mean. There are a lot of changes in the regulatory landscape to try and promote reporting of clinical trials with a good clinical trials initiative and sort of including patients earlier on in their design so that hopefully we get it right first time around. Yeah. Exactly. In the clinic uh, in the in the in the planning, in the question still, what, what is worth to be a clinical trial um, question and and of course, uh, quality of life is getting more insight because that was left out long ago and, and all the questionnaires were bad, really bad because they were taken from, not from, from, the, special, um, from the special disease area. So it's, it was, yeah. 
And I can see a question from Linda saying that serious concern for patients with chronic long-term condition is not immediately life-threatening, is that you don't wish to destabilize your existing treatment. How do you manage the situation? I think that would very much depend on your clinical situation. So I also have a condition called mast cell activation syndrome, which means I have a lot of side effects and I have a lot of sort of allergic reactions. My mother goes into full-blown anaphylaxis as I'm always getting side effects from different medications. And I think it's a case of having very good rapport with a research nurse or a clinician who can help you make that decision to risk benefit as to whether or not you should proceed with something which initially may make you feel rough or you might get exacerbation but it may also lead in the medium to long term to an improvement so I think managing that situation has to be a highly individualized um, approach. Yeah absolutely and yeah there's a lot of factors to take into, into, into account as well there. Um, yeah, maybe a last question to that, uh, yeah, why you would participate in a trial. Uh, is there any of, of the three of you would, that would have any recommendation for the audience? If you if you are a patient, what to do? Uh, um, is there any initiative that you can recommend uh, that they should? Because indeed, yeah, like you, Sabine, you are informed by your oncologist. Is there anything else that you would think of? Yeah, can can people do? It's still very centered on the oncologists because you don't have these platforms and they tried, but they st very often stopped in the beginning saying this is going to be a platform in two years. It never became a platform. So uh, I don't know any organization really informing you. I think this is still a goal we have uh, and what we are fighting for. And it has to be together, academia, uh, pharma, CROs, everything who, who put all this together on, on European and worldwide, international and national uh, levels. And the power is still on the doctors. And if they they are not in the research, then very often they don't know either. <laughs> yeah, because indeed, I, I recently saw uh, uh, some statistics that indeed there's only like 5% of the doctors participating in clinical trials, which is striking and of course we have the study nurses too but they are only involved when you're in the clinical trial already so it's yeah here in austria it might be different everywhere else i don't know but maybe that is something that technology can help change because now we have more opportunities with decentralized yeah. remote clinical trials to for example go to a local site have local care or have a local gp manage us as opposed to having to travel to a specialist center depending if you have a rare disease, obviously it's very different, but I think um, it, it's it's important to try and explore and capitalize on opportunities through digital to get more people interested that wouldn't necessarily have the means to travel otherwise. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, and that also leads me into into that third bucket of our, of our discussion in the future of clinical trials. And you see indeed a lot of things happening in decentralized trials, to name one of them. Um, do you see any anything else that, that you would like to see change in the future? Uh, well, I guess like change yeah, from a translational medicine approach. So obviously people think in silos because of the nature of how long it takes to train a particular area. But if there's anything we can engage from the pandemic and or also I suppose in genomics and sort of developments in, in that kind of field is the earlier you get to some of the better. So I think there should be far more of a focus on preventative health and actually looking at uh, a person through a system thinking approach, you know, how it affects you, your condition is very different. In personalized medicine is the way forward, but we're not going to get there unless we have a lot more collaboration and dialogue. Yeah, and, and, and do you see that collaboration dialogue even further increasing? I hope so. The EU is not yet. Money. <laughs> not yet, because you 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 are not informed. They don't say thank you for your participation. Nothing. Farmers try to do that, but the national academia doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. They say they do, but they don't yet. Yeah. Well, there is academia. Uh, in this event here, and we're going to put it online. So I, I hope that also we as ECCRT then contribute. And I know that even my oncologist who is in research wants it. Yeah. He wants it, he's for it, but 
the rest. So it's, yeah, it, it's only individuals who then do something. Yeah. I think I think that's where you get bodies, isn't it? The European Cancer Market Access Lobby or organizations that group together to try and make change um, at an EU level that can have power to get things done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And well, and there are associations uh, like and they they do a lot. Uh, like I know friends that your body is celebrating their 10th year of, of uh, existence uh, today, precisely, actually. Um, yeah, and, and I think we can only encourage those organizations and associations to to like continue on the, the way that they, they started and, and to like like spread the word, I would say, because indeed you see a lot individual uh, of a lot of individual actions, but yeah, the key is in, indeed making us all work together. No? I think it would be nice to think we can get collaboration where patients are equal stakeholders and patient experts can contribute in designing clinical trials that fit patient needs yep. in a way that's actually going to make meaningful impact for the person going through the trial, not just from a clinical research objective, but also for something that matters to you as a patient. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and well, and, and there is there is a big effort also from the industry. Eh? Like, for instance, like I mentioned earlier with PFMD, uh, patient engagement is really high on the agenda of most of the companies nowadays. But indeed, I think, yeah, it's it's really taking that next higher level in, on, in, in that sense right, to really make a change. I think there's still work to do. And you always have to distinguish between the normal patients, you can take them for the stories, and the patient advocates or experts who are trained in taking part in all the commissions and all the steps. And we plan here a univers uni university um, course uh, of three, three semesters for patient advocates in Austria to become, to become more professional. Yeah. All right. Um, Maybe one last question because I, I'm conscious of the time and, and, and probably people have other things to do afterwards. Maybe one last question before we wrap it up. Um, for the three of you, uh, would you have any recommendation for a sponsor or an organizer of a clinical trial? What should they do different in your opinion? Can I say? Sure, Joanna. Can I speak? Johanna, I think you freeze now a bit because maybe while Johanna is getting... You're frozen, Johanna, we can't hear you. Maybe I, Jenny or Sabina, you want to go first while connection gets better for uh, Johanna? I don't really know <laughs> because I don't find an organization. I mean... Even your party or other organ or your audits for the rare diseases or whatsoever, but that's not enough. So, yeah, I think I'm still in the beginning. <laughs> Somehow. Any 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 ideas for you, Jenny? What was the question again? It was how can we make the system better? Yeah. I think from a sponsor point of view, try to think slightly outside the box, try to make logistics more simple with, with you know, facilitating uh, sort of uh, more locations and sort of involving digital means. But I would also say there's a key to striking the right balance between getting the lay public sort of opinion versus, as Sabina alluded to, patient experts that are trained to form vigilance and regulatory affairs that can actually design clinical endpoints and really um, sort of represent knowledge of what it feels like to live with that condition at a, an in advanced level of insight. I would also argue um, it's key to get representativeness and to try to get more diversity of people that don't normally take part in trials. And the only way you're going to do that is if you help promote health literacy and I think you know initiatives like you guys, your courses and, and you Patty and your orders, it, they're great to sort of provide people with basic knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um yeah I think yeah creating that awareness and and and, and, yeah, and, and I think we should have the opportunity nowadays everything with digital and social media there's ways enough to reach people and, and future patients, I would say. Huh? Donna, you're back, I see. 
So you wanted to comment on what you would like to uh, change uh, or what uh, concerns sponsor? I, I didn't hear anything of what you said. I had a really bad connection and I lost everything. I, I don't know what you discussed. So no, well, you were going to comment on, on, on my question. Hey, what, what, what would you like to do different uh, for, for a sponsor? What would you recommend a sponsor could do different or could do it a different way um, in the future? I think the connection is not really good for Johanna, unfortunately. I can answer some more if you like. I think embedding um, patient reported experience, patient reported outcomes, patient insight early on in the actual design of a protocol is key and also trying to ensure that there are different people have choice, people have options. You can decide on a case by case basis. Some days you might feel like traveling to a hospital three or four hours away, others you may not. So I think flexibility should be the key that sponsors should be thinking about how to make it really least disruptive for a patient to take part in the trial because you're not going to get drop out much. Yeah. yeah, correct. I also see there's a discussion in the chat around a patient uh, uh, platform platforms uh, being available uh, where uh, trials can be found. Indeed, there are a number of platforms, but again, there's no cohesion. There's no like overarching, at least not to my knowledge also, and if someone knows, feel free to put it in the chat. Again, we can then also help maybe other people. Uh, no to... platforms. Sorry, Sabine. The platforms don't exist. Yeah. We want them and we, we, we really shout for them for years now, but it's very difficult to create them. It can't be done by a patient organization alone. It's much too much and uh, mm -hmm. yes. Would that then be a call for a more governmental approach, like in, from from the governmental side? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I hope that they will also hear us uh, in in our in our. Of course, uh, because on, if we do it with the farmer, then they will shout, "It's always the farmer, and where's the rest?" It has to be really combined: academia, government, farmer. It has to be the whole bunch. Yeah. yeah. And I also see a question on like the other way around uh, how pharma companies would like uh, announce their need for patients in their trials. Um, yeah, it's also good questions. And yeah, there are ways to do that. There's social media also where companies do that, but do they reach the right audience? Sabine, the real Clinical.gov was meant, yeah. but that doesn't really help. It's an awful platform. Yes. Yeah. It's it's uh, it's it's the central platform, but try to read it, and it's for lay people. It's nothing. It's uh, yeah, it's quite difficult for yeah, because well, actually, and well, I wouldn't consider you as as lay people anymore, uh, uh, Sabine and Jenny and and Yona. You you have been through that experience. You always have to realize that people have very little knowledge about it, and how can you imagine a, a person suffering from a disease going to an English? A website that may not speak the language. So it is kind of tough. Yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yes, it's very difficult. And if you are uh, have no relation to any, you have no knowledge of uh, uh, science, uh, uh, you cannot understand anything at the start. Yeah. Slowly, slowly, you start. To understand some things, you ask the doctors to explain to you, but it's very, very difficult at the start. Yeah. Because you know yeah. nothing. Yeah. yeah. But the knowledge is power, and that's why the more you are, you understand, yes. can potentially drive yes. change. But yes. I yes. We all become very boring dinner party guests because we become obsessed with our conditions. Yeah. <laughs> right. I cannot see anything now, uh, but I can hear you. I do not see anybody. So okay. well, well, we can see you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah, and, and what I, I was just thinking about what we think, even thinking about around the languages, uh, as, as most of the, 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 the communication and documentation is in English, where it should actually not be a problem. If you see how Europe is handling, the European Union is working and, and, and is able to share a lot of things in all those different languages. So you would think, well, there are 
ways to do it. Eh? But well, and I'm and I'm sure they also like are very open uh, to discussing that and and to to help. Uh, and there's a lot of funds going in that. I'm I'm very sure. Uh, let let this event only be like support to that. Um, so let me also like um, wrap it up uh, because we, we I don't really want to go too much over time. I, um, I would like to start with really very sincerely, really sincerely thank our three speakers. I'm not going to call them patients. Uh, they are very brave people, uh, and I see it also in the chat. People have loved your contributions to to really where even people saying, "Oh, it, uh, I've never been so close to an actual patient." And well, that that. That is what we wanted to achieve here. So thank you very much, Joanna. Thank you very much, Sabine. And thank, thank you, you very much, Jenny. It's really greatly appreciated that you share this with us. Um, it's really uh, heartwarming also to, to see the audience applauding now. So thank you for being with us. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed it very much and uh, that yeah you, you found it useful. And if you want us to do something else, you can always reach out to ECCRT. We are also very much uh, along uh, with uh, this journey. If we can contribute to anything by any means, feel free to reach out to us. And uh, I'm going to show you a last slide where you indeed can see our details. Uh, so if if you want to reach to us, you can come and visit if you want, uh, uh, but you can email us or uh, phone us uh, anytime. Thank you, Benedict, and thank you all for watching. Thank you very much. Thank you, I look forward to you to talking to you again in the near future. Thank you all. All the best. Bye bye. 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 Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Bye. If you want, you can stay on, uh, uh, Sabine and, and Joanna. You can make a little debrief. <laughs> I tried to go out, but I don't have to. <laughs> I cannot see. Sorry when they were frozen, really.